thank you. I want to thank the organizers of the session for having accepted my, my communication. And I was uh, looking forward to hearing the previous one, the previous talk by Elizabeth Hikes. So um, un unfortunately, she has not been able to come. But as she was also talking about uh, colonialism, gender, and feminism, I wanted to, to engage with her, uh, her talk. But well, I, I'll try to do my best uh, by my own. And so the, the aim of my talk is, is going to be to try to understand how different oppressions um, overlapped on the native women of an archipelago in the Pacific, the Mariana Islands. And uh, in order to do so, uh, first of all, I will try to introduce the geographical and, and historical context of the research from which my theoretical perspective will stem. Um, secondly, I will dwell on the case study that I have chosen to illustrate this theory, which is uh, an anal analysis of the ethnosexual violences suffered by these native women, uh, the so-called Zamorra. Zamorro is the, the endonym that uh, local inhabitants of the Mariana Islands used to refer to themselves nowadays. Um, and also the condition of semi-slavery that these women suffered in the island during the, the early 18th century. Uh, once exposed to this case study, I will move for forward to propose uh, two theoretical tools, intersectionality on, on the one hand, and the matrix of oppression on the other one, in order to try to understand how these women suffered uh, different oppressions during their life, such as um, age, especially gender, and, and ethnicity. Um, finally, I will conclude with a reflection on, on how these theoretical tools can, can, um, uh, can help us to develop a historical archaeology uh, from a feminist and a decolonial standpoint. So, well, I have already mentioned that my research is geographic, geographically framed in the Mariana Archipelago, which is a set of islands, of 14 islands, located in the Micronesia. And as you can see in the map, it is uh, in, at the east of the Philippines and in the south of, of Japan. And um, this, this island, the occupation of this island, began in 1668, when a group of Jesuit missionaries, missionaries coming from Mexico, um, established a, a mission uh, under the direction of Father Diego Luis de San Vitores, in order to, um, to evangelize the native population of the island. So they established the mi mission in Guam, which is the biggest and southernmost of the island. And even though the first contacts between these fathers and native populations were gentle and even hospitable, uh, shortly after the arrival of the first colonists, uh, the first hostilities began. Um, one Spanish researcher working in the archipelago, David Atienza, claims that these hostilities uh, are due to, the, for example, some local uh, spiritual leaders, the so-called Macanas, in the regional language, uh, and also in the resistance, in so, some cases violent, shown by chamorros to baptism. Some of the chamorros, especially the the leaders of each community uh, wanted to be baptized only themselves, not, not the rest of the community. And as the Jesuit claimed that everyone should be evangelized, they, they, they originated a climate of tension that would end, end up in armed conflicts, the so-called Spanish Zamorra conflicts that would last 30 years, three decades. Um, the end of these conflicts uh, arrived in 1699, when all the Zamorros from the different islands, from the 14 islands, were relocated in some villages um, constructed by the Spaniards and following, at some point, European standards, the so-called Reducciones in Guam, in the main island. And I, I claim that this, this relocation, this reduction, as they say in Spanish, Reducción of the Zamorros, uh, implied a destructuration of the ancient ways of lives of these populations, as well as a reorganization of the task 
uh, of production, production of food, as well as on the sex gender system that existed in the island prior to the arrival of the colonizers. Uh, in this new uh, colonial order, uh, we will see that ethnosexual violence was systematically applied against native women by the colonial authorities. And also, um, as I, I will mention uh, later, they were, some of them were subject to a semi-slavery condition in the plantations that arose in, in, in the island, in Guam. Um, by ethnosexual, here, ethnosexual violence, I refer to the term coined by researcher Joan Nagel, uh, who defines it, and I quote, as the intersection and interaction between ethnicity and sexuality and the ways in which each defines and depends on the other for its meaning and power. End of the quote. Uh, in the sources, well, what I do is historical archaeology, so I have to, to rely both in, in text and in, in material culture. So from the, the text, from the documents, most of them written by the Jesuits, uh, we know that there are several testimonies uh, about this ethnosexual violence exercised against women. Uh, for example, uh, in a letter from 1720, uh, one of the military men based in the island accused the local governor, uh, the, the higher, higher um, authority in the island, accused him uh, of having in his palace a female school where native girls were, uh, were um, uh, located. Uh, and he accuses him of committing abominations towards these girls. And Abominations, by abominations, I mean sexual assaults. Um, and he also mentions that these abominations were carried out in such a public manner that back in the Philippines, in Manila, uh, people, uh, well, the, the palace of this governor came to be known and, as the Great Turk's brother, like a brother, where he abused uh, those native girls. Um, likewise, some, some mayors, from the, the villages, follow this ex the example of the governor and also assault, sexually assault, the women of their, of their villages. Uh, to the point that in 1724, a judge is sent from Manila to Hakanya, which is the capital of Guam, in order to investigate these uh, sexual abuses and also to investigate the, the, the abuses and the harsh conditions that both male and female Chamorro suffered in the plantations, where they had to work until exhaustion without, any, without a wage. The only thing they received for, for the work was two leaves of to two tobacco leaves. So um, you can see here that well, he, he prepares, this judge prepares um, an interrogation. And in this interrogation, the 17th question, as you can see here, is whether the mayor of, of, the, of that village has given scandal in his village by usurping women from married men or with other cohabitations, amancebamientos in, in Spanish. And in the table, you may see that in five out of 11 villages, the witnesses claimed that they had seen sexual abuses towards the, their women. They say that those mayors committed these honest acts and abuses to the women regardless or whether they were married or not. So as this case is shown, um, Chamorro women suffered in the new colonial situation a double oppression or double subalternization because they were subject to the colonial authorities as well as their, their male counterparts, the uh, Chamorro men, but they were also subject, and here's where the double oppression comes, to the men of their communities as the mayors that were native people as well as to the Spanish men. So, um, according to another letter from the uh, 1730s, we also know uh, more, more things about the semi-slavery condition that these women suffer in the fields where they work and in the plantations. So, in this letter from the 1730s, um, another Jesuit claims that native women married to native um, men, to, to Chamorro men, uh, had to work in the fields mandatory, while um, 
On the contrary, those who are married to Hispanic soldiers, and I say Hispanic, not Spanish, because most of them came from the Philippines and from Mexico, those women were exempt from working on the fields. And that, that fact gave rise to a problem for the colonial authorities because the harsh conditions in the plantations um, result in, in these native women married to native uh, uh, men, they, they didn't have children. They, they, due to these like, harsh physical conditions, they were aborting or having miscarriages, while the native women married to soldiers were having many children. And that was a problem for the colony because uh, the native women married to native, uh, the, the sons, sorry, the children of native women married to native men were the ones that worked in the fields. So they were running out of, of hands to work the fields. So, yeah, I'll, although I will not go farther into this issue, I, I would like to, to point out that this problem was a biopolitical uh, problem, one of the first like manifestations of biopolitics, because uh, the measures that the colonial authorities put into practice to solve this problem took a part of the population as the subject of, of these measures. And that's what Michel Foucault uh, claims to be bio, biopolitics. So, um, for example, I, I brought a quote from, from the letter I made sure before to see how harsh those conditions were in the plantation that says, uh, and I quote, Indian wo women married to Indian men, either they have no virtue to conceive to, due to that conditions, or they sterilize themselves on purpose for not giving birth to slaves for the Spaniards, as they have claimed at some, at some time. So you can see from, from these facts that the situations might have been really, really hard. For them. So, in order to analyze the different oppressions that overlapped in those Samoro women that were oppressed both by, by their gender and also by their ethnic origin, and, and also some of them uh, because of their marriage to native men, uh, two theoretical tools are, are um, important. And, and two, two, these two tools derived from black feminist, uh, black feminism. <coughs> So the first one would be intersectionality. Intersectionality was first applied by jurist uh, Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, when she was studying um, the discrimi discrimination suffered by uh, black women uh, in court. In, in a very interesting case, where the black women applied for a job in a factory and where they were rejected um, because they were women and black, but when they uh, took the case to the court, the judge said that mm, they had not been discriminated because in that factory there, there were white women working in administrative uh, works and black men working in mechanical works. So they say, as they are, uh, you, are you are not discriminated as women because they are women working, by, but white women, and you are not discriminated as black because they are black men working. So Kimberly Crenshaw um, coined this term, intersectionality, to show that when people, such as black women, suffer two oppressions, the, the, the resulting oppression is not the sum of these two different axes of oppression, but a different one, a genuine new oppression. So, um, however, I consider that the, the virtue of intersectionality is also one of, of its defects of, or of the limits. Because I consider that uh, the focus that intersectionality places on individual mm, uh, makes it not the most appropriate tool to, to understand how different oppressions are mutually interrelated and produce and sustain in a society. As it is focused only in the individual and not in the community, uh, it talks about how a, pers a person suffers different oppressions, but not about how these oppressions emerge and are sustained and reproduced. So, um, for studying uh, the different oppressions suffered by groups such as Chamorro women, I will suggest another, uh, another term, the matrix of oppression, uh, developed by, by Patricia Hill, Co Hill Collins in his well-known book, Black Feminist Thought, in the year 2000. And she defines it in her own words, and I quote, as the overall social organization within which intersecting oppressions originate, developed, and are contained. You see that it works in a macro level, 
or the intersectionality works in a micro level. So um, she claims that it is through this uh, matrix, matrix of oppression that social di diversity is categorized into different social difference, and later this difference, uh, in some cases, originates uh, inequalities and social hierarchies. And um, one one advantage of using matrix of oppressions uh, against intersectionality is that the matrix of, of oppression also takes into account privilege and sees privilege as a counterpart of oppression. For example, intersectionality is a theory of oppression and talks about the different oppressions that cross an individual, but it does not see that any oppression has the counterpart as a privilege and that we are also crossed by privilege. And that, for example, uh, you can be, a, I don't know, like a gay, um, from the working class and be oppressed by these two, but you can also be a man and have this privilege and white and able. So what the matrix recognizes is that we are both crossed by privileges and by oppressions and also by difference that, and that's obvious now that we uh, are, are also white, that not only the oppressed one are marked as black, but we are also positively marked as white, for example, or as men and women. Um, so another another um, advantage of the matrix of oppression is that it does not level oppressions. In intersectionality, perfect. Intersectionality said that we were all crossed by by oppressions, but without hierarchizing them. And the matrix of oppression takes into account this thing that, for example, when speaking about slavery, maybe for slaves it was more important being black, for example, for slave women than women, because if they were men, they will still suffer slavery, but if they were white, they might not have suffered. So I also wanted to say that this, the, this, is, this um, stance, the matrix of oppression, is also, also concurs with the approaches that the decolonial feminists are, are producing uh, to study sex, gender, and ethnicity, such as, for example, Maria Lugones, who talks about the modern colonial gender system, or Rita, Laura Rita Segato, who talks about the modern colonial matrix. So to conclude, um, I would like to give an example of how I apply this to my, my, my case study, the, the study I mentioned before. So for example, in the case that, uh, of Tamara women that m were married to native men, the axis of oppression that's, that crossed them were the same as those ones of their, their female mates that were married to the soldiers. They were both Tamorro and both women, but while ones were oppressed and had to work in the fields for being married to native men, the other one uh, has the privilege of exempting from, from them just because of marriage, which is not such a like identity thing, but an institution. So the matrix of oppression also allows us to understand how different institutions, one could be marriage, another one in the island was, for example, the religious congregation. There was a religious congregation called the Our Lady of, of Light, and those summer women participating in this congregation had several privileges also within the, 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 the society. And for example, another one in our current society will be education. So, for example, um, if you read uh, Owen Jones uh, talking about working class here in the UK, he claims that mm, while two per uh, people uh, from the working class and with the same wage, uh, one may be considered a chap because he's not educated, while the other one, the educated one, might consider him like middle class, which is not the reality. Due to his wage and the amount of money that he receives, he's also part of the working class, but education makes him or her believe that he's in another social position. So education, marriage, uh, religious uh, <coughs> congregations. Um, uh, I, I would also like to claim in relation to archaeology that these matrices of oppression uh, are emerged and especially maintained, sustained and reproduced through very material uh, context. We have seen the importance of space and buildings when I was talking about the palace of the governor uh, I have no time to explain, but it was very important also the girls' school in its village, where they were um, they were almost con like jail because they, they could not go outside, and the the colleges were very uh, narrow, and they have a few windows and just one door, and it was locked during the night. 
So the school, the church, the confessionals also in the church, where these women were exposed to what is called the crime of solicitation, that is sexual assaults by the, the religious people, the, the fathers, and also the, the own body and, and the dress of these women. Because you, could, you can see in this drawing from the 19th century at Samara women working in the fields, shirtless, and with no doubt, I think that these conditions, this, the, activities, the activities associated to one uh, privilege or one oppression also shape the bodies of, of these women, the, the tone of the skin and, and everything. So finally, uh, I would like to point out that these matrices of oppression in archaeology uh, not only serve to analyze the past, but also to examine pra practices such in the present. For example, in my case, uh, I work from an ex-metropolis, Spain, in an old colony, Guam, an ex-colony of, of my state, and with the, with the objective of understanding the context of both uh, contexts. But uh, that has to make me aware of the privilege I have being a European in, in Guam, for example, and also I have to be aware of the possible oppressions that I can be perpetuating at different levels through my practices in, in the field and also with the outcomes of my research. And that's all. Thank you.